We have traded your healing for our hatred, your calling for our comfort, your truth for our traditions, your covenant for our conventions, your faithfulness for our fragmentation, your care for our convenience, your solidarity for our self-righteousness, your promise for our praise. Forgive us, we pray. Speak to us again of your love, that we may know you, and by knowing you, we may once again be made whole. Amen. Beloved of God, hear the good news. God's love never fails us. Even in our division and despair, God desires to be made known. We are forgiven, we are welcome, and we are one. Amen. which surpasses all understanding, the love of Christ that guards our hearts and minds, and the joy and consolation of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may be seated. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. Let us pray. Oh God, form the minds of your faithful people into your one will. Make us love what you command and desire, what you promise that amid all the changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joy is found. Your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning again, welcome and announcements. All announcements and prayer requests for our weekly announcements are due in our church office no later than noon on Tuesday. Please keep this in mind as you submit your announcements to our church office. June is our month to support Lutheran Social Services of New York Hunger Prevention Program. And this is at the New Life Center on Long Island. You can help by contributing items from the list which is attached to this email. Let's make June a great month with our contributions to our neighbors in need. Uh, we want to con resume Sunday school, but in order to prepare, we need to know the ages of our participants. Registration forms are available. You can obtain one by contacting the church office or Joy Washington. All forms should be returned to Joy at the email um, listed here. In addition, we are still in need of an additional Sunday school and a confirmation teachers. Please contact Pastor Linda if you are interested in fulfilling this role. Experience is not necessary. We want to continue offering a Black History Moment once each month. So we need your help. Please contact Pastor by email or phone if you're willing to offer a presentation. And even if you don't have an idea for a topic, pastor will be happy to assist with that. Here ends the Good Shepherd announcements. Pastor, do you have anything else to say? Okay. Uh, the calendar of events. On Wednesday, June the 1st, at 7 a.m., we will have our uh, morning prayer and devotion on Zoom. And on Thursday, June the 2nd, at 7 p.m., the mu music ministry choir will, um, choir rehearsal will take place in the sanctuary. And of course, on June the 5th, it's Pentecost Sunday, and we will meet back in the sanctuary uh, for a service of worship and Holy Communion. And the color of the day is red. So we would want to make a note that on that day we can wear red. So that's it for my calendar of events. So before we hear our Black History Moment for this month from Florence, I just want to say that I'm happy to have my family here with me worshiping today. Um, it's always a great joy for me to be able to be with them because we are all separated by miles. So when I can get one or two of them together, but this week I've got four, so it's great. Also, I'd like to um, 
we will lift in prayer uh, in Thanksgiving, but I want to mention this. Tomorrow, one of our mothers of the church, Mother Shepherd, will be celebrating her 97th birthday. Happy, happy birthday, Mother Shepherd. I know you are there on Zoom. I miss seeing your face in the sanctuary, but I know you're there on Zoom. So happy, happy birthday to you. And now Florence. Good morning, visitors and church family. And you are church family, although I put it that way. Okay, my name is Florence Thompson, and I'm from Jamaica. And so I just found it befitting to talk about someone for the Black History Celebration who is from Jamaica. Okay. Its name is Marcus Garvey. He was a Jamaican political activist, a publisher, a journalist, an entrepreneur, and a narrator. He was the founder and first president general of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, through which he declared himself, he declared himself provisional president of Africa. He was born on August 17 at St. Anne's Bay in Jamaica, and he attended school in Jamaica, but left when he was 14 years old. He was Jamaica's first national hero. He founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association in 1914. He founded the People Political Party of Jamaica, which we call the PNP. In his early years, he attended school in Jamaica, but when he was 14, he left St. Anne's for Kingston, which is the capital of Jamaica. He worked as an apprentice in a printing office, and later he said he first experienced racism in grade school in Kingston. This work would set the stage for his activism later in his life. He spent time in Central America with the relatives before moving to London in 1912. While he was in London, he attended university. After two years in London, he received an education that would have been unavailable to him in the Americas because of the color of his skin. Garvey returned to Jamaica it was during this time he started the Universal Negro Improvement Association. He began co corresponding with Booker T. Washington, the African-American leader, Arthur and activist who had been born into slavery in 1916. He then boarded a ship bound for the United States where as a dramatic and invigorating public speaker he intended to go on a lecture tour. He ended up in New York City, where he first spoke at the famous St. Mark's Church, which is in Brooklyn, still is, before embarking on a 38-day city speaking tour. He also took on work in a print shop to make ends meet. While in New York, he authored the Declaration of Rights of the Negro Peoples of the World, world which was ratified at the Convention of the Universal Negro Improvement Association at Madison Square Garden. This was in 1920. It was during this meeting that Garvey was also elected provisional president of 
Africa. He inspired every black movement of the 20th century. The, uh, okay, time. In the United States, he was a noted civil rights activist who founded the Negro World Newspaper, the shipping company, Boy Black Star, and the Universal Negro Improvement Association, a fraternal organization of black nationalists. As a group, they advocated for a separate but equal stature for peoples of African ancestry, and as such, they sought to establish independent black states around the world notable in Liberia or on the west coast of Africa. Um, he became restless and um, he founded the, I said that already, I'm getting a little mixed up here. Marcus Garvey <clears throat> believed that the white society would never accept black Americans as equals. Therefore, he called for the separate self-development of African Americans within the United States to achieve these goals. In 1920, Garvey established the Negro Factories Corporation and offered stock of the American Americans to buy. African Americans to buy and set up many small black owned businesses such as stores, restaurants, gro <laughs> groceries, a millinery store, a steam laundry, and a tailor shop, dressmaking shop, publishing house, and even a toy company that made black dolls. He also raised $1 million for the project. It was generated income and provided jobs for the numerous enterprises listed above. He also um, had a head office in Harlem. Garvey's success in mobilizing blacks earned him the suspicion of the US government. His brand of nationalism also led to bitter feuds with other black leaders, including Afro-American and Indians. The most notable of Garvey's rivals, um, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, described him as dictatorial, domineering, inordinately vain, and very suspicious. It was, however, <clears throat> the purchase of the S.S. Borean to be renamed S.S. Phyllis Wheatley that drew the attention of Edgar Hoover and the who was now in the FBI, that led to Garvey's downfall. A poor economy and the near bankruptcy of the Black Star Line caused Garvey to seek more dues paying members for the union. He launched a recruitment campaign in the South, which he had ignored because of strong white resistance. In 1923, he hired his first Black agents in history to get rid of Marcus Garvey. The US authorities successfully prosecuted him and convicted him on trumped up charges for mail fraud in connection with stock selling for the Black Star Line. He served two years in, <coughs> in jail and was then immediately deported from the United States. I think he was the first Jamaican to be deported. Um, <coughs> however, He returned to England and um, he stressed racial pride and self-improvement, much of the views of educator Booker T. Washington, whom Garvey admired. So he hooked himself up with a lot of people who were fighting for the cause. After he left England, um, Jamaica, he went back to England and he, I'm sorry. Uh, 
Okay. After he left, <clears throat> after he was um, discharged from the prison, he spent time in Central America with the relatives before. I think I went through that already. I'm sorry. I'm really a little mixed up. Anyway, Garvey's famous quotes were, if we as a people realize the greatness from which we came, we would be less likely to disrespect ourselves. I trust that we'll so live today as to realize that you are masters of your own destiny, masters of your fate. If there is anything you want in this world, it is for you to strike out with confidence and faith in self and reach for it. And um, he always talked about emancipating yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. And that's how um, Bob Marley made that song, because he instructed him to do so. A people without the knowledge of their past history, origin and culture is like a tree without roots. So what he's saying is take advantage of every opportunity that there, where there is none, make it for yourself. Liberate the minds of men, and ultimately, you will liberate the bodies of men. The black, the black skin is not a badge of shame, but rather a glorious symbol of national greatness. With confidence, you have won before you have started. And so he spent his last years in England, where he died and was buried there. and. Um, he, um, he died in 1940. His body was brought back to Jamaica in 1964 and buried in the National Heroes Park in Kingston. And so that was our Jamaican guy, was very assertive from way back when. But he strived for Black people and he thought Black people should feel good about themselves and let the world see that they can do anything. And that's a short synopsis of Marcus Garvey. Thank you. Thank you, Florence, for highlighting Marcus Garvey for us. And I just had to say personally, um, I, don't, I don't often reflect on Marcus Garvey often, but he was very influential in my life because my family were staunch members of the UNIA the entire time I was growing up. So I spent every Saturday at the UNIA Hall in North Philadelphia learning about the history of black folks. So um, I owe a personal debt to Marcus Garvey. Cassidy. Good morning. <clears throat> Please rise as you are able now and help me to bless our lector for today. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we turn to you in our need. Bless our lector Cassidy as we open our ears to hear, our minds to comprehend, our hearts to receive. Like our ancestors before us, we open ourselves to your message. Your visions and words proclaim the good news you have to share with us. Amen. You may be seated. First reading, Acts. Chapter 16, verses 16 through 34. A reading from the Acts. Those who had enslaved a girl and used her powers to tell fortunes threw Paul and Silas into jail for ordering the spirit to come out of her and consequently ruining their business. In prison, 
Paul and Silas bring the good news of the gospel to the jailer and his family. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves of the most high God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned to the spirit Turn to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owner saw that they were, that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or to observe. The crowd joined in attacking them and, ma and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet into the stock. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up, and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down, trembling before Paul in silence. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he said, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. Word of God, word of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, you righteous. The psalm for today is Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad. Clouds and darkness surround the Lord. Righteousness and justice are foundation of God's throne. Fire goes before the Lord, burning up enemies, one ice, one every side. Lightning light up the world. The earth sees the trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens declare righteousness of the Lord, and all the people see your glory. Confounded be all who worship, carved image and delight in false goods. Bow down before the Lord, all you gods. Zion hears and be glad, and citizens of because of your judgments, O Lord. For you are the Lord, most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You are God guarded the allies of the saints and his children. Light dawns from the righteous and joy from the harness of heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, 
and give thanks to God, his holy name. Amen. Second reading, Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 through 14, 16, 16 through 17, 20 through 21. A reading from Revelation. The ascended Christ, hidden from our sight, promises to come again. We eagerly pray, come Lord Jesus, with all who respond to this invitation. See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. It is I, Jesus, who, have, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let everyone who hears say, come, and let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift. The one who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. Word of God, word of life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Beloved of God, I invite you now to listen to the Holy Gospel according to John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus prayed, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am <clears throat> to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. And these, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them and I will make it known so that, the love that, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This beloved is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated.
Choir. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Every praise is to our God. Amen. So if you are expecting a sermon today highlighting the happenings of the past couple weeks, you will not be getting that. If you are like me, you have been beat up and beat down by all the things that are going on. And frankly, I did not want to go there today because every other day, that's where I have lived. So while some of the things that I say may sound like things that have happened, that's only because the times that we are living in are truly troubled. In the reading from Acts this morning, we hear a story about the adventures of the apostles, of the apostles Paul and Silas. 
They were out spreading the good news of Jesus throughout Macedonia. And in this account that we heard this morning, there is a lot going on. And generally, we hear about Paul and Silas and the, and, and the earthquake and the prisoners are set free. But there's a lot going on in this story this morning. So here's a couple of things. There's an exorcism. There's a mob scene. There's a kangaroo court. There's a flogging. There's a prison cell. There's a prison church. There's an act of God. There's an altar call. There's a conversion. There are some baptisms. And then it all ends with all these new friends gathered around a table sharing food and hospitality in the name of Jesus. So that's a lot. Did you hear all that as that story was being read this morning? See, Paul and Silas were kind of an anomaly in and of themselves because Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. And Paul and Silas were Jews. And Paul and Silas self-identified as citizens of the kingdom of God. Roman, Jewish, and part of the kingdom, an anomaly for that day and time. You see, Paul and Silas were no namby-pamby apostles. They were risk takers and truth tellers. The thing that I have been talking to you about the past several weeks that we ought to be endeavoring to be ourselves. So as a result of their risk-taking and truth-telling, they were dragged into court and they were jailed. And not just the one time that we heard about this morning, they were jailed over and over and over again. So there are some key characters aside from Paul and Silas. As I read this story, I see us meeting some other imprisoned characters. And I just want to investigate them just a little closer. There are two individuals and a group. And from my reading of this text, I see these three characters, each of being in need of freedom. They are in need of being set free in their own ways. There's the slave girl, there are her owners, and there is the jailer. So first, let's look at the slave girl. Who was she? We don't know. She has no name. She's called a diviner. Now, a diviner was someone who was possessed by a spirit that was not of God, and, and to be exact, the spirit that she was supposed to be possessed of is this spirit called the python spirit, a snake spirit. And so they believed that these people who were, uh, who were possessed by this particular evil spirit could tell people's fortunes. And since that was her gift, that gift made her a commodity. She herself was a small, profitable business. And as a slave, she didn't have any say over her own life because she was the object of her owners. But as Paul and Silas went on their way to pray each day, the girl followed them through the streets of Philippi, and the spirit within her would shout out, these men are slaves of the Most High God. They proclaim God is the way to salvation. Now that was true. That's what they were doing. But isn't it interesting that she calls Paul and Silas slaves, slaves of God? She herself was a slave. So who's really the slave here? 
But Paul, being, being Paul, was so annoyed. He was annoyed at having this shouting little girl follow him every day that he finally turned to her and he said, Spirit, come out. He didn't tell the girl to shut up. He talked directly to the spirit. And the spirit left her and she was free. Now we don't know what happened to this little girl after she was freed. Scripture doesn't tell us. The text leaves this nameless girl and her future to our imagination. So what happened to her when she was no longer of use to those owners? Was she cast away? Did she become a follower of Jesus? Well, I believe that the silence in the text proposes that we use our own imagination. So I used mine. And do you remember Lydia from last week's text? the wealthy woman who became the leader of the growing church in Philippi. In my holy imagination, I would like to think that Lydia took this slave girl in. I would like to imagine that Lydia treated this slave girl with kindness and honor as all of the followers of Christ are supposed to do. I'd like to imagine that Lydia gave the girl some work that was dignifying and humane. And I like to imagine that the girl became a part of that group of wise women there in Philippi who went out to pray for everyone every day. I like to imagine that this girl set free went on to live her new life in Christ. A new life that God had intended for her from the beginning. So I don't know if you have ever in your own life seen this kind of transformation, seen someone's life turn completely around. Maybe you've seen someone set free from something that kept them enslaved in their own prisons. Beloved, transformation is holy. So that's the first character. Second, we have the slave girl's owners. I only have a little bit to say about them. <laughs> but what do we know about them? Simply that they were shareholders in this slave girl. And as we meet them in the story, they are livid. They are furious. Their lucrative income stream has been interrupted, suddenly cut off by Paul demanding that the spirit come out. So in their anger, they gathered all of the, of the civic leaders, and they were sure that the civic leaders were going to understand their side of the story because this was truly having a negative impact on them. And this Paul and Silas over here, well, they are followers of a God that we don't know. So they dragged Paul and Silas into the civil courts, accusing them of threatening the community's way of life and customs. You see, those owners, they were shackled by their own greed. They couldn't see beyond their own selfishness. Their hope was put in making money. Their hope was in the God of mammon. And greed was their version of captivity. So I ask you, beloved, what happens when economics and religious convictions collide? Like Paul releasing that girl from her oppression. Can it have perilous? Consequences? When religious conviction moves beyond the safe 
safe concern into real action, into doing things that are risky, into telling the truth, people start to take notice, and many of them are not happy. When we move from sending a few dollars to a charity of our choice to saying no more to the unjust treatment of others, people start to notice. When income streams are threatened, like all of the gun companies in this country, people notice and they get really angry. So how do we respond, beloved? How do we respond in the name of Christ to a situation where children and others are being treated like commodities? What is our personal and our collective responsibility to speak out against these unjust systems? When, beloved, when do we speak out against systems that use people as commodities? When do we do it? When do we take that risk? When do we tell that truth? Even at the risk of upsetting some people and knowing that there are going to be people who are going to be against us. Beloved, when do we speak out against systems that use people as commodities, even when our actions are going to shake up the powers that be? These are hard questions, beloved. I know they are, but they are questions that are necessary to be asked today, and they deserve an answer and action today. I believe that we would be deaf readers and hearers, not just of this text, but of any text. If we don't hear the hard questions that these texts are asking us today, as followers of Christ, People, we have a calling. Each and every one of us has a calling to stand for justice. You have heard me preach over and over again that the God that we claim to serve is a God of justice. And where do we see justice lacking today? That's where we're called to stand, beloved. How many nameless young boys and young girls are there who tragically re resemble this slave girl? Like all children that we know to be abused and or misused, this slave girl was bound by a spirit that she could not free herself from, not any more than any of the children who we send off to school every day can free themselves from the terrors that they may face. This girl was in bondage to a system, just as many of us are. But just like Paul, beloved, we are mandated to be instruments of God's liberation. Instruments of God's liberation for the most vulnerable among us. We can't just feel badly. We can't just wring our hands. We can't just pray and wait. We pray, and we do. Third and last, we have the jailer. Who was he? He too was nameless, and he also in his own way was a slave to the Roman penal system. He dutifully, dutifully responded to the orders that were given him after Paul and Silas were flogged. The jailer threw them into the innermost cell, shackled their feet. You see, he was a company guy. He was very obedient, diligent in making sure that he met all of his responsibilities as they were given to him. But then while the jailer was sleeping on the job, the prisoners were singing and praying. And I like to imagine that they were quoting those words that we heard from Psalm 97 about the power of God being like an earthquake when that earthquake shook that building. It was so intense 
that the prisoners were shaken so powerfully that their shackles fell off. And terrified of what would happen to him if his superiors discovered that he had lost all the prisoners, the jailer was ready to fall on his own sword. But Paul called out to him and stopped him short. Don't harm yourself, Paul said. We are all here. And these are words that we also heard last week. Do not be afraid. We are all here. These words, beloved, I think we all yearn to hear and to believe when we are feeling anxious and desperate. And that's how I have been feeling lately, anxious and desperate. But what comes next is something that we should be paying attention to. What comes next is the jailer's question. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be set free? And beloved, Paul tells him the liberating good news of Jesus Christ. That is the news that unshackles us from what imprisons and enslaves us. You've heard me say this before, but I believe that each one of us has our own form of chains our own form of shackles, our own demons that we have to reckon with. So be honest with yourselves about what yours are. Is it doubt or fear or anxiety? Is it the inability to forgive yourself for something in your past or the inability to forgive someone else? Is it your dependence on your bank account? Is it your self-pride or your controlling spirit? Is it painful childhood memories? What are your demons? Beloved, we can't be afraid to name the things that might be enslaving us individually, and we can't be afraid to name the things that are enslaving us communally and corporately. We can't be afraid to bring those things to light. We can't be afraid to step out and speak up. The jailers question, what must I do to be set free? Now the answer can shake our insides just like that earthquake. Transformation and emancipation, beloved, can be bittersweet. Being set free takes time and patience and courage. It takes courage to be changed. It takes courage to embrace the change that is happening. That's what happened to the little girl. That's what happened to the jailer. Even though we don't know their names, we know that they encountered the name of Jesus. And we know that when they did, their lives were transformed. They were shaken and they were set free. But not only was it them, everyone around them, their friends, their family, they were all impacted by that as well. Paul tells us in scripture that God has not given us a spirit of fear. Instead, we have a spirit of power and love and strength. Beloved, we do not have to be overcome by fear. And we are never, ever alone as we continue to march towards freedom. But it takes all of us, beloved, not just one. So trust. Trust that Christ is risen. Trust that God is with us. And stand. 
stand in courage to address the, sy the systems that continue to threaten to enslave us all. Amen. Amen.
Please join me now as we use the words of the Apostles' Creed to profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our service continues with prayers of intercession. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation, responding to each petition with words. Hear our prayer. Holy God, make your people one as you and your son are one. Extend the gifts we have been given by your spirit to all people, especially those experiencing division or questioning your love. God, in your mercy, Gracious and holy God, we pray for peace between nations and an end to war across the globe. Lead us from death to life, from falsehood to truth. Lead us from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead us from hate to love, from war to peace. Let your peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. God, in your mercy. God, our healer and refuge, we pray for all who suffer from gun violence. Today, we pray especially for all of the victims of the mass shootings in U Uvalde, Texas. Laguana Woods, California, and Buffalo, New York. With your mercy, comfort those who are mourning. For the wounded, we ask that you bind up their wounds, restore their bodies, and heal their hearts. With your might, empower us to change this broken world. Make us advocates for change that will move us to justice for all. God, in your mercy. Grant freedom to all who are overwhelmed by chronic illness, depression, or constant worry. Today, we also for those from this community who we name before you now. Prayers of healing and comfort are asked for Pat, for Urban, Monte, for Joan, for Dr. Brown, for Marie and family, for Delroy, for Duane, for Bill, Julia, for Pastor Richard, Lee and Pat, Pastor Cara, Pastor Brenda, Madeline Dorette, Pastor Katrina, and family, Zanita and Clement, Bernice, Bruce and Rita, Paul, Nora, Cecil, Wade, Emmy, Ernestine, and Glenwood.
with your might empower us to change this world, broken world. Open them to receive health and salvation in Christ Jesus through the Spirit's gift of faith. God, in your mercy. Stir imagination and understanding throughout. Lead us into new visions and fresh expressions of your presence. God, in your mercy. Place, love, place holy love at the center of all our relationships and communities. By your love, heal us, convict us, and renew us. Bring an end to racism in our churches and our communities. Let everyone know your goodness by the love we show one another. We also pray for ourselves. They are not the desires of our hearts. Lord, I lift up the people of Uvalde and Laguana, California, and Buffalo. Father, I know by experience what, what it is to to lose a loved one or what it is, lose a loved one in, in, in the fact that their lives were shattered. 13 years ago, my grandson was shot in Hempstead. And today, 26 years old, he, his life, he can't, you know, he can't do anything. He's, 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 he can't do anything, this, this handsome, prosperous looking young man just because of gun violence. So I just, I just feel for, for, for those people because I have a personal experience with gun violence. Lord, We cry out to you, oh God, because who else can we turn to? Who else can we turn to? So I ask you, Lord, just instill in us the love that Jesus taught us, Lord, that we could change our trajectory from hate and, and racism and, and violence to, to just live the way you want us to live for you, God. My heart cries out for these people. I don't know what they're feeling. For your child to be sent to school and then to hear that they may be dead. I know how that feels. I know how it feels. God, give us strength. Give us love in our hearts that we won't hate the people who has done evil to us. Lift up the people that has experienced violence for these past years and strength in them, Lord. And help them to draw closer to you. Give these people peace, oh God. The peace that only you can give. Hear now the desires of our, our hearts. And thank you, Father, for your love and for always being there for us even in the darkest moments. God, in your mercy. <sighs> you
unite us with the saints who have died and been raised in Jesus. On this Memorial Day weekend, we pray for all who are remembering and honoring loved ones who died while serving this country in the armed forces and our civilians. Help us to wait with eager longing for Christ to come again, even as we sense his presence with us now. God, in your mercy, in your mercy, O oh God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. You may hold up your check, your phone, or any means of giving as we pray together. Holy God, spirits. Feeding, stopping. Please rise as you are able. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You are Lord, our, <clears throat> our most high over, over all heaven and earth. You are exalted above all others. You love those who hate evil. You guard the lives of your faithful. You rescue them from the hand of the wicked. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power. O 
holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. He is the Prince of Peace and gives us deep peace within our souls. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. In the night in which our Lord was to be betrayed, he took bread. He gave thanks for it. He broke it. And he gave it to all who were there, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Each time you eat of this bread, do this in remembrance of me. As was the custom after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, gave thanks for it, and then gave it to all who were present, saying, take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink from this cup, do this in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all gathered under the sound of my voice and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Your spirit teaches us everything and gives us peace. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all glory and honor is yours now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lamb of God, you, you take, take away, away the sin of the world. Beloved of God, my brothers and sisters, let us now all commune together. The body of Christ broken for you.
the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen us all and keep us in God's grace. Amen. Amen. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup, we have tasted the new heaven and earth where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection that through our lives, all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Receive the charge and the blessing. People of God, go forth from this time together and imitate the Holy One in all you do. Live with love, speak with kindness, touch with gentleness, walk with humbleness and build up the kingdom of God. Go forth into the world and live in love just as Christ has lived in and through you. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Beloved, we leave this, this place of prayer to join God in listening to the hopes and dreams, the hidden fears and the doubts of our neighbors. We leave this place of grace, beloved, to share the compassion of, joy, of the joy of Jesus with others so that they will discover how deeply they too are loved. Beloved, we leave this place with people, with, we leave this place to be with the people of our world so that the Spirit might bless us with their rich gifts so that we may discover our oneness the oneness that we all have in God. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. God has done for you. Thanks be to God. My beloved brothers and sisters, as always, is my hope and my prayer that something 
said today, something sung today, or just being in the presence of God and among your siblings in Christ has lifted you and given you sustenance for your journey. God bless you all until we meet again. Amen. Good morning, folks. Can somebody give me a sound check? Can you hear me? Thank you, Vilka. And can someone say something so I can see if Pastor will be able to hear you? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Great. Hello. Hi, Pastor. Hi. <laughs> Thank How's you everybody for... today? Not bad. Thank you for the wishes for mom. She's actually upstairs, but she heard the, the birthday blessing. And she oh, good. Good. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad she heard it. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's... Oh, so I see Lee and Pat are there, Helen, um, Galaxy. I'm never sure exactly who that is. <laughs> and Ernestine and Karen and Naraya and Vioka, thanks so much for being with us today. Enjoy the rest of this holiday weekend. And um, I look forward to seeing you guys either at Bible study or, in, or for worship next week as we celebrate Pentecost. Enjoy your family. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Yeah, we're gonna, it's it's nice to have them here. Yes. Okay. Bye -bye. Take good care, everyone. Have a good week. Okay.
Bye, everyone. Have a great Memorial Day weekend.